Okay. Good to see you, everyone. They always give me the, the slot right after lunch. I don't know what's that. Um, they either expect me to wake you up or they just let you sleep. Do you have the siesta thing going on in Croatia? Like, no? No? Okay, if you want to go sleep, just sit in the back. Don't worry about it. I'll try to be not too much, uh, making too much noise. <laughs> right, um, my name is Milan Jankov. I work for a company called LifeRay. And uh, we do some, uh, anyone familiar with LifeRay? Ah, okay, half of the room, that's interesting. Um, so we do this thing, uh, historically was a, a portal, and it's more of a platform um, these days, but I'm not gonna bother you with that. The reason is, um, the, the reason I'm mentioning it is, uh, it turns out modularity is a very, very important concern for us, so we invested a lot of time into all kinds of modularity, um, approaches, and this is what I'm going to be talking about here, uh, uh, which is modularity and what comes in Java 9. And since I only have like 20 something minutes now, I'm going to try to rush through it. Um, apologies for that. So, when I say not new, a lot of people are like, hey, what do you mean not new? There's a whole lot of new things in Java 9 going on. That's true. What I mean by not new is not new in not in the sense of a tooling or the APIs or the frameworks or anything like that that comes in Java 9, but rather the concept of modularity. The concept of modularity in Java is totally not new, and I'll try to prove that to you. Um, quickly go through some history, why it is about time to talk about that. Um, you may be familiar, uh, the whole stuff about modularizing Java, it's pretty old. Now, I reached back to sources that are available, and they reached back to 2005 with JSR 277 and 294, and what we're currently dealing with is 376. Um, but actually, this goes even back in the time. I think the first attempt to modularize Java was about 2001. Just, uh, it's not available anywhere in the internet yet. <clears throat> and this is a picture from DevOps in 2015, where they put this on the table. Will we be using Jigsaw in 2016? Um, that's a very interesting result. And they got it right, as you can see. Uh, so Jigsaw wasn't released in 2016, even if it was supposed to be. And it's my favorite comment down here, say, you can pry OSGI from my cold dead hands. Uh, I don't know, I wasn't the one who wrote it, but um, it's basically to give you the idea that hey, the, the, the whole thing, the problem they're trying to solve, it's already being solved. Um, later on, there was an announcement that Java 9 will be postponed to 2017. It was supposed to be released, I think, February or March. That didn't happen. What you currently have is a countdown here that counts you the day before Java 9 is released. It's scheduled for uh, what it is, a, um, May, July, I believe. Um, uh, I'm pretty skeptical about it, and if you go and um, uh, follow the mailing lists of the JPMS working group, you will know why. Um, anyways, uh, before we talk about modularity and how Java solves that problem and what is it in there, we need to define modularity. And there is a problem with that. It's been a problem for a very long time. For that very reason, for those of you who are familiar with Alice in Wonderland, is the word modularity. It basically means whatever you want it to mean, neither more nor less. So it depends on who says the word modularity, they have different things in mind. So they're obviously proposing different solutions for the different problems they're imagining when they pronounce that word. So this is something Dr. Graham Charters proposed several years ago <clears throat> at the OSGI community event. He said, let's define modularity, and he based it on very much known maturity models. So this is known as modularity maturity model by Dr. Graham Charters. It has six levels. So level one is ad hoc, where you have no modularity at all. Then you have modules where you decoupled from the artifact, so you have a, an identity of something instead of an artifact. Then level three, you have the modularity where you want to decouple from I, that identity, so you just want to have a kind of relationship based on rules rather than identities. Uh, so you are kind of uh, depending on implementations. Loose coupling is the next level that even 
pr allows you to have a modularity that decouples you from this implementation, so it's more of an abstraction layer. Um, and then you have a devolution which decouples you from ownership, and the final layer is dynamism, where you've decoupled from time. And now everyone is confused, like, hey, wait, wait a minute, how can we be decoupled from time? Basically what that means is uh, that you acknowledge the fact things will change and you prepare to deal with that change. That's how you decouple yourself from time. Actually, Graham Charters provided level seven, which is called Peter Creans. And it's only available for people who are Peter Creans. And now you don't know who Peter Creans, if you don't know who Peter Creans is, that's the guy who uh, spent his lifetime uh, studying and doing stuff with modularity and one of the main architects behind the OSGI platform. So Peter Kriens took over that in a book known as a Java application architecture. He didn't write the book, he wrote the foreword for the book and where he says, that's a pretty good model, but if I were to define it, I would just go for the following five levels, and I'm going to call them manage, managing dependencies, proper isolation, minimize coupling, and service-oriented architecture. So when I was preparing this talk, I was like, okay, which one should I use? And um, I was like, nah, neither. I'm going to make my own. So here you go. This is your buzzword compliant modularity maturity model. And the reason for that is because we are all buzz buzzword driven these days, right? How many of you do microservices? Hey, that's the wrong conference, I guess. <laughs> that's the first time in my life, seriously. OK, big data? Uh, you're lying now. Uh, that's, that can't be true. <laughs> anyway, you know how it works, right? You hear the buzzword, you go home, and you, you start doing stuff just because everyone else seems to be doing it, which excludes everyone in this room, apparently. Um, uh, so the, the five level based on buzzwords are monolith, composite, containers, discovery, and microservices. So basically what that means for you is when you have the monolith, you're unaware of any dependencies. You put the whole thing together, you deploy it, you don't care. Uh, right? Everything's in the box. Now, that's obviously having some issues long term. So you want to make a composite. So you want to put things together uh, and compose them, right? And this is uh, where you start being aware of the architectural dependencies that you have. But that only gives you the, the artifact dependencies. So you can go one step further and say, actually, I want to depend on functionalities. I want to have a functionality related to another functionality instead of a jar file relating to another jar file. Right? That gives you level three. In the level four, you are no longer based on dependencies, but you are based on the requirements. So basically say, I want someone, I don't care who and how, but I want someone to fulfill my requirements. So that's a total different level of abstraction that you want to get. And the, the level five is the level which gives you an adaptation to changing requirements. So you basically say, I do acknowledge the fact the requirements will change. So this binding that I have of today, it's valid as of today. It may not be valid tomorrow. So how do you, what the tools are available to, to deal with those things? Monolith is Java, put the whole thing on a class path, don't bother. Um, the, then you want to deal with composites, and most people deal with this by using tools like Maven. And I don't mean Maven the build tool, but rather Maven Central. So we have all these jar files in Maven Central, and you don't refer to a jar file by saying, I want this jar file, but what you say is, I want a, a jar file with this identity. And it's a name and a version, right? And this is how you manage this. And if you've been working long enough with Maven, you probably know how many times you have to write the exclude uh, thing to get your dependencies right. So at level three, this is combined kind of with level two, you want to manage things more on the containers level, so more on the functional side. So here you have tools like Java Enterprise, CDI, uh, Spring, or whatever, that kind of tells, allows you to express dependencies in a more functional way. My component depends on another component, right? But you still rely on Maven to figure out that uh, this jar file is dependent on that jar file in order for this component to be dependent on that other component. Right? So you kind of need the two levels at the same time. What gives you level four in Java? Anyone willing to, tr to, to try to guess? No surprise, because there is nothing that gives you level four in Java. It's GI. 
that gives you all the five levels. And that's pretty much the only technologies. Now, I know if someone's familiar with JBoss modules and other architectures, they, that's the time where they're going to jump and say, no, 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 that's not the only. But OSGI is the de facto standard for modularity in Java. And it gives you all the five levels. Where the Java 9 modularity fits in, how do you think? I'm not going to wait too much. I'm just going to show you. It's kind of like this. And you, you probably now wonder, what, what, wait a minute, what, what does it mean? I'll cover that in details. The reason it, it looks like this is because one of the main architectural decisions they took when they designed the whole thing is to keep it simple. And we'll see when that is a problem. Um, but first, let's quickly go through modularity from application perspective. That's your application. And as you can see, it consists of a bunch of classes that works nicely together. Pretty much. Uh, actually, that's not our application. Our application is more like this. It's up there. Those are your libraries. And this is the Java platform. And they all work nice together. Uh, and if you want to change things, well, it's easy, right? You just need to dig, unlock this, and look it somewhere, and it works. Um, so, obviously, there's a problem. So, OSGI came up some time ago and said, well, let's figure out a way to solve that problem. What would they do is they look at the down, down there at the JVM and say, well, we don't own that thing. There's nothing we can do about it. It's, it's Sun or Oracle or whoever who can do something. It's, it's out of scope for us. So, that stays. But there is a Funny thing that everything about it, including that, but we can't touch that, it's loaded by a class loader. So if we can get our hands on the class loaders and define the, a different way of managing those guys above, we can actually build a modular system that's pretty nice. So that's what they did. It's totally based on class loaders and defines a dynamic multi-layer modular runtime that allows you to, to you know, pretty much define an organized way of, and of how things work together. Now, the question is, what happens to these guys? Because right? those are libraries. Those are not your code. It's someone else's code. Well, they came up to the conclusion that OSGI is so easy that everyone's going to just do OSGI bundles and modules, and the world's going to be perfect. And you know how that ended up working. Um, so it didn't work very well. But hey, the idea is there. It's been there for over 10 years, I believe, now. The reason it didn't work is because a lot of people started to believe that OSGI is too complex, too complicated, and it's pretty much impossible to work with. What they didn't realize is that the problem they were trying to solve, modularizing an application, is a hard problem. And therefore, because you're solving a hard problem, it, the complexity comes from the domain. It's not coming from the technology that tries to solve the issues of that domain. But they will, whoever didn't understand that will understand it now when they try Java 9, because uh, they're going to run into the exact same issues. So how JPMS, and JPMS is a uh, Java platform modular system. I think that's the official name for the, the whole thing, uh, known also as GSR386 and uh, 376, and uh, also um, uh, Jigsaw. So they own the JVM. So basically, they said, oh, we'll fix that on a JVM level. And there is modules as a first class citizens. Now the JVM is aware of the fact that you have modules. right? That's a good thing. How are we going to fill the, uh, fix the apps? Well, we have modules. It's your problem now. We just use our modules, and it's all good. Right? We give you the basic rules, and you go from here. How we fix application, uh, sorry, uh, libraries, exact same thing. It's just we give you the platform. You build modules. Everyone's happy. We live in a perfect world. OK, some, I've been criticized for using the word must, because it's not really true at the moment, because right now, you don't really um, in a situation where you must use modules, because J, uh, Java 9 is going to give you a backward compatibility option to run uh, as the old-fashioned Java. But long term, you will be forced to move into that world, whether you like it or not. So when I say not new, this is basically what I'm saying. This guys here, this stuff down here, the modular Java runtime, that's new. That wasn't there before. And so they did a great job modularizing the JDK and the JVM and the Java language. This stuff up here, all the libraries and tools and your applications, it's totally not new. If you wanted to do modular apps, 
You could do it in Java 6, in Java 5. It's been there for over 10 years. It's just no one, well, not no one, but a lot of people didn't care about it anymore because no one was forcing you to. And uh, a lot of people believe uh, that they've been building modular apps, and they're about to discover that they have not been building modular apps, much like Spring and Hibernate and all these guys discovered that their applications are not so modular as soon as they tried to migrate them to Java 9. So that is about to happen. Um, <clears throat> has it worked? Okay. So, I was talking about when keep it simple is not enough. And to illustrate that, this is gonna go, I'm going to show you how we built applications. It's pretty much how we built products. So you don't build products starting from raw materials, right? You use some intermediate materials. To build those intermediate materials, you use some other and so forth. So this is a process of dependency. So if you want to build, say, a robot like this guy, you're going to need a bunch of things uh, to, before you can create it. So you're going to need some tools, you're going to need some software, you're going to need some computers, uh, you're going to need some hardware, probably a lot of other things. So those are kind of your dependencies, right? But for the people who build these guys, who provide you those tools, they're also going to need some tools or some cables or power plugs or whatever. So this builds you a dependency graph. So you, you, you want one thing, but for one thing to, kind of to show up, there is something else that needs to be there and so forth. So now this graph is very wrong for one reason. It's a cyclic. And it's perfect from software engineer perspective because that's what we love, a cyclic graphs, because they allow us to do you know much easier to deal with them much easier. In the real world scenario though, if you were to tr to draw this, how that would work, you would probably draw arrows all over the place. Because probably these guys are also using computers and some hardware and, and so forth. Right? But from software development perspective, we want to try to think to keep things simple. We try to imagine a perfect world, right? Where we have have the ideal dependencies so we can ideally model the world. All right, let's stick with that. So the big circle is the producer, the single, the small ones are the things that they produce for you. So as you can see, you don't really care about the producer, but you care about the things that you can get from them. And that's basically the same thing, like if you put it in a more generic way, you have an entity and they offer you something. So in the application world, it's pretty much the same thing. You have an artifact, and that artifact offers you something. So that's, that's what you care about, what you can get from that artifact, not the artifact itself. And so let's, with that in mind, let's compare the two. So the level two is where you want to decouple yourself from the artifact. So both frameworks, OSGI and JPMS, allows you to do that. The artifact in OSGI is a traditional JAR file. In JPMS, you can either use JAR or the new JMOD thing. And then in OSGI, you can define your uh, ID of your module in manifest.mf file. And Java, it's module info, Java that gets compiled to a class file. So it's pretty much the same thing. So if you think at level two, they provide pretty much the same functionality. So it's all good. Now let's go on level three. So now you want to decouple from identity. So you don't want to depend on the artifact, but you want to depend on what is actually giving it to you. So in OSGI, you have this thing called export package. So basically, this tells you this artifact provides you those things, right? And in JPMS, you have exports, pretty much the same thing. The flip side of that is more interesting. Because in OSGI, you could say, long time ago, uh, require a bundle. And you basically say, my module wants this other module, right? And no one uses this. It's deprecated. And every single person that knows well enough is just going to tell you, stay away from that, because this has been the source of all disasters of OSGI in the past. Now, what we have in OSGI these days is the import package. So basically, you say, I don't care. I don't want to depend on, on the provider. I want to get the thing that it gives me. I want that package. That's what I care about. I don't care who gives it to me. I want that package. Now, Java, this JPMS decided to keep things simple, so they go with that approach. They say, require other module. So they just say, I care about the provider of the thing and not the thing itself. Now, why is that a problem? Imagine that you want a power plug for building your whatever, a computer or a, um, a hi-fi system. So in OSGI world, that's what you're going to say. You're going to say, I need a power plug. 
I don't care who provides it, who manufactures it, I just want a power block. In JPMS world, what you need to say is, well, I need Foo because I know it offers power plugs, and I know that in my world, only Foo is allowed to offer power plugs. This, if you put that in a real world scenario, it sounds ridiculous. But this is what you get when you try to make things simple, right? Um, the, the key here is who knows. In, in OSGI world, it's the system that knows. The system knows what you need. In JPMS world, it's you, the developer, that knows what the system needs, right? So that's a fundamental difference in how you design your application. So that's also uh, a matter of uh, what if there are different versions of things? In OSGI world, you could say, well, I know that there are five different versions of, of power plugs, but I can only work with version two to three. And in, in, in JPMS, there's no way of telling that because there's no notion of, of versioning. You as a developer need to know that this particular model of yours wants this other particular models of someone in particular version, if there's version at all. I don't want to get into versioning because right now there is an ongoing discussion on JPMS mailing list about versions, and that's probably about to change. But as of now, that's how the situation looks like. So the flip side is, uh, no, not the flip side, but another aspect of this is the re-exporting thing. Say you want to get something, but that something also depends on something else. Like in OSGI world, you can use this uses case uh, clause to say, well, this package that I'm exporting uses this other package, so you have a, uh, like a, a um, um, let's go embedded, not embedded, uh, transitive relationship. In JPMS, you can only do require public. So basically, what you're saying is, um, in, in OSGI world, you say, well, I used the power plug that was to build this computer. So if you want to use this computer, and eventually you want to change your power plug, those are the power plugs that you are, that's are compatible with it. In JS, JPMS world, you basically say, well, I used that provider. So now you depend transitively depend on that particular provider. Again, no notion of versions. So as you can see, the level three is kind of there, but it's, it's a lot more limited in what you can design in terms of modular system. Let's go on level four. Uh, level four. And level four is decoupled from implementation. So let's say you want to uh, you want to be more generic about your dependencies, and actually don't talk about dependencies, but talk about requirements. So that's what OSGI allows you to do during, uh, because of the resolver. You can say, well, I have a requirement, and my requirement is for my device to function, it needs to be connected to a power socket. Because it's actually, if you think about it, it's not the power plug that you're interested in. The power plug is something that connects you to power socket, and it's the power that you're interested in. So you can define a requirement and say, if someone can connect me to a power, I'm good to go. I don't care about power plugs anymore. Right? And this is what's known as a requirement in OSGI. And then on the other side, you can have someone else who can provide you a capability and say, well, I can connect you to a power. No, don't ask me how. I, I just can do that, right? Uh, that there's no notion of that, obviously, in, uh, uh, in JPMS. Uh, so it's very basic APIs, but really hard to do. And finally, it's the dynamism. It's the things that come and go. So in OSGI, you have the notion of service registry. So you can say, now I register the service, and in some time, the service is going to go away. Uh, and everyone is aware of the life cycle of things showing up and going away, because you acknowledge the fact that things change. Uh, in JPMS, it's a, it's a static modular system by design. So you can't do any of those things. So it is very, very limited. Now, there is a notion of layers in JPMS, and this is what the Java Enterprise is expected to, uh, to work with to provide you a dynamic loading of, um, of um, artifacts, which is a fundamental uh, design of, of Java EE. But anyway, so after all this, you may ask yourself, OK, wait a minute. This guy is telling us that JPMS got the whole thing wrong. 
And uh, that's not the case. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is, again, this. The, the, the word modularity means whatever you want it to mean. So from them, from Oracle's perspective, they wanted to build a modular J, JVM, and they did. So when they did, that was JVM had its own restrictions, and it has to be backward compatibility, compat compatible. So basically what they designed is a system that perfectly fits for modularizing the JDK itself. What went wrong, if you ask me, is that someone came up with the idea that the exact same system is a good system to apply to building modular applications. And this is where the whole thing will eventually break, in my opinion, because the system was designed, taken into consideration the restrictions and requirements of the JVM and not Java applications. So this is where things are, are, are wrong. And if you actually go and look into the goals that G, the Jigsaw and JPM is trying to solve, the original goals, there is nothing about applications. They all talk about the JVM. And as far as JVM is concerned, they did a good job. That, that, that must be said, right? So some people believe that as soon as people start using JPMS and Java 9, they will figure out how limited it is and, 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 and the, all the issues, and they will switch to OSGI. I don't think so. I think a lot of marketing is going on in here, and a lot of people will just keep doing it no matter what. But we'll see. That's, uh, that's uh, something in the future. Um, one question, finally, that you may want to ask yourself is, oh, wait a minute, you show us five levels of modularity, but what if I'm just fine with doing the, the, the two levels of modularity, uh, or three, or whatever? That's fine. Uh, there are different use cases. Uh, what I want to tell you is that we wanted level five for the product that we built, and for us it was a, a must-have. Right? Because the essence of modularity is not knowing. And we're building a product, we're giving this product to people, and we have absolutely no knowledge how people will use that product. So for us, not knowing is a day-to-day -day basis. We have no idea what people will do with it. Um, this is um, uh, uh, called Life Radios. It's a single platform, over 100 applications, over 600 modules, and I think 2,500 microservices. Microservices being here an OSGI microservices, which is where the term comes from originally before it became the buzzword. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few examples to understand where is our use case, uh, some from our use cases. So for example, this is how you build a RESTful service. You basically say, I require a capability. My service requires an OSGI contract, and the name of that contract is Java JAX RS of version 2. So you don't say, I want Jersey, or I want Jack, uh, you know, a particular implementation. You say, I want someone to be able to serve RESTful services. I don't care who, I don't care how. That's my requirement. On the other side, you have another component that says, I do provide a capability, and that capability is Java JAX RS, and it has this dependency, this, it uses these packages, and it's version 2. And there's the resolver that is capable of matching those two and saying, oh, wait a minute, you want this, you have this, so you guys work, work it out together. Right? So this gives you a total different level of, of flexibility. And it's all managed by components and, um, and references. This is pretty much uh, to what you used to from Spring or um, a Java EE, where you basically say, this is my component, and it depends on, on some other thing. The difference is, when you say you reference another component, you can actually say that the reference policy is dynamic. So you basically say, I know this thing can come and go any time, and I'm prepared to deal with that. So you're dealing with, with modularity, with uh, dynamism, and you decide what to do uh, when the service is, uh, is gone. So the essence of modularity is not knowing. And once you acknowledge the fact that you're dealing with an application that does not know how it will have to behave tomorrow, you need that level five, and that enforces you to optimize for predictability. And if you think about all the agile uh, movement and all the processes that we apply in, um, in a, um, a software development process, not the software itself, that's all about uh, uh, what we're trying to aim. Like, agile is all about predictability. It's all about, oh, let's not 
put the full spec up front, right? Let's d evolve and see where it goes. And, but we, for some reason, don't want to apply that to software itself because it seems so complicated. So the, the whole concept of modularity is to acknowledge the fact that you don't know everything up, up front and optimize for predictability, which basically gives you what we call an application agility. It gives you an agile application that is capable to adapt to changing requirements um, in the future. That's pretty much all from me. I just wanted to say, finally, that we do organize a, um, that's a DEF CON is a library specific conference, but we also organize a thing called ModConf, which this year is going to be in Amsterdam in October. So if you want to hear more about modularity, all these con the concepts, uh, and you care about trip to Amsterdam, feel free to apply for talks or join us. That's it. Thank you. Sorry for the rush report. <laughs> we don't have time for questions, right? We have? We have one minute for questions, so no questions. So we don't have time for questions. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>